chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. can't believe that I did that. First time for everything. And we're looking at verse 27, beginning of verse 27. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. And the Lord of the, the Lord, the word of the Lord. Can we stand tonight in honor of the reading of God's word? You know, the Bible said the assembly of Israel stood as the word of God was read. And that's to honor God's word. Beginning at verse 27, the word of the Lord reads, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea and Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. I'm going to read that much tonight because this message is, is a pretty full message and I want to get into this right away and get as much covered as I can. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this place. We're grateful, God, that we have a place, an opportunity to come and to hear from you and to receive from your Spirit. Lord, we ask tonight, O oh God, that you would anoint our lips of clay. Allow us to deliver your word, Master, faithfully. Let every word go forth with boldness and power and Lord and love, that every ear of every hearer might receive and be blessed. And we ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. The actual text that I would like to have read, this is, is a telling of the story. You may be seated. This is a telling of the story, but it's not the telling of the story that I actually had meant to read to you. But that's okay. You know the story. Everybody's heard this story many times over. And I'm pretty sure what I wanted to read to you was most likely found in the book of John, in John's uh, rendition of this particular event. There was a point in time where Jesus took his disciples aside and he questioned them. He asked them the question, who do men say that I am? What have you heard? What little ideas and theories are being touted out there that have become privy to your hearing? And the apostles began to answer, well, some say that you're John the Baptist reincarnated. You know, Others believe maybe you're Isaiah or maybe Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Now, folks, I hate to tell you, but the, the Jewish people are not a believer in reincarnation. So there had to be a reason that so many Jews were looking at Jesus and seeing his miraculous works and thinking that, gee, you know, maybe this guy is... One of the prophets come back to life. Maybe this is Isaiah come back to life or Jeremiah come back to life because they, they didn't believe in reincarnation as a rule. But his works were so miraculous that it began to make them think that, well, maybe his very identity is miraculous. And what they didn't realize was his identity was miraculous, but it wasn't what they were seeing. It wasn't what they were reasoning. It wasn't what they were thinking. There was something more at work in the man, Jesus Christ, in that flesh and blood human form that they were looking upon. There was something greater working. And as the Lord was listening to all these man-made con concepts of who He was, and all these ideologies and theories, He then responds by saying to His apostles, Who do you say that I am? i got news for you tonight, friends. You can sit and listen to all kinds of theories about who God is and who Jesus Christ is and all this, and that's all well and good. But in the final analysis, it's going to come down to who do you say that I am? Amen. 
A lot of people are going to wind up in a hell that they don't believe in because they're in an organization that's telling them who Jesus Christ is and he is not who they're telling him that he is. And you can't get into heaven by going to a church that will tell you who he is either. Peter jumps up and he says, Lord, thou art the Christ. The Christ, what did that mean? He, thou art the Messiah, the promised one. But he didn't stop there. No, Peter went a step further. He said, thou art the Christ. He said, the Son of the living God. And for a Jew to speak the word that a man standing before him was the Son of the living God. He was saying, you are Jehovah God standing before me in flesh and blood form. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. In the other declaration of God in a human form would be considered idolatry. So when God revealed himself in human form, he was called the Son. But that did not make him another person. It was still Jehovah God Almighty. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. I got news for you. Jesus turned around and said, Oh, Peter, <laughs> flesh and blood. You see all those theories, all those people out there talking. There's not a one of them that revealed this to you. <laughs> oh, but this came by the divine spirit of God Almighty alone. Hallelujah. Rather than listening to the voices of men, Peter, you are listening to the voice of God. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. In the apostolic church, we believe in the doctrine of revelation. That doesn't mean we believe in the book of revelation. We do, but it's not what I mean when I say the doctrine of revelation. What we mean by we believe in the doctrine of revelation is we believe you can read the Bible till you turn purple and never know the truth about who Jesus Christ is. We believe you can listen to every kind of preacher and every kind of doctrine and every kind of dogma and every kind of theory and every kind of theologian until you drop dead and never know who Jesus Christ is. Because it comes only, Jesus said, by revelation, hallelujah. And until you've heard from God, you'll never know who Jesus is. But I know his name. I've used his name. Why don't you know this group over here casts out demons in Jesus' name. So they must know who he is. And this group over here lays hands on the sick in Jesus' name. So they must know who he is. I got news for you. You can know the power of the name and not know the God who owns the name. But you can't know the God without knowing what his name is. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, when you know who God is, you know he's called Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo! Jesus said, many will come and say, but I cast out devils in your name. He said, sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Come on now. You see, you can use the name and still not know who you're talking about. I've got news. Spanish people use the name of Jesus every day. They named the children Jesus. Jesus is the Latin version of the name Jesus. You can know the name. You can use the name. And it is no more valuable to you than quoting the name of Jesus Rodriguez. Because it doesn't mean knowing the name does not mean you know the owner of that name. Jesus said, you can't know me 
unless it's revealed to you. It comes only by revelation. And when an organization comes along and says, you need to let us teach you who God is. Let us show you who God is. You know what? There are a bunch of lying sacks of garbage from hell, and you need to run. Because it's impossible for anyone to show you who God is. God said, I speak for myself. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I don't need a witness. He said, I am a witness of myself. Hallelujah. He said, I don't need anybody to tell anybody who I am. He said, hey, I'll tell you who I am. When you understand the political climate, when you understand the spiritual environment of the Lord's day, you begin to understand why so much of his teaching and so much of what he had to say was almost spoken in a code form, as it were. He had to do this because if he were not to have done this, the overzealous men of his day who were waiting for their Redeemer and their Messiah to arise and to bring political freedom and liberation to their people, the Hebrew people, would have risen up and would have made him king and would have tried to reclaim the land of Israel as their own and would have tried to reject the Roman Empire. And Jesus knew. He knew, I have not come that I might restore Israel at this time. I have come to redeem all who will believe. Hallelujah. He had a job that was bigger than the house of Israel. That's why he said to his disciples, I have sheep in another fold that you don't know anything about. He said, I've come not just for Israel. There are Gentiles out there that I'm going to save too. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. My glory to God. You know what? Jesus was so happy with what Peter said to him that he responded to Peter. He said, Oh, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't, hasn't revealed this unto you. He said, But I'll tell you what. He said, You remember when I first met you? I said your name would be Cephas, which means a pebble or a stone. It's a little old something that you make pavement out of, that you make a roadway out of, for people to walk on it, and for animals to travel on it. He said, well, Peter, he said, upon this rock, I'm changing this pebble into a rock, hallelujah. He said, I'm changing this pavement into a building rock upon which I will establish my church, hallelujah. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The, the, the Reformation period created a lot of dogmas that swing so far in one direction in order to counter the Roman Catholic extravagances on the other end of the spectrum. And in most churches today, it is commonly preached that when the Lord spoke these words to Peter, what he was really saying, and I love when they throw in, you know, what he was really saying. What he was really saying was, upon this declaration of faith, I'll build my church. That's not what he said. He said, your name is Jesus. But upon this rock. He was making a clear declaration that he was about to change this little pebble of a man into a great big old foundation stone. Amen. He said, upon this rock, he was talking about Peter, honey. Now, we're not going to go to the extreme and believe that this meant Peter was the first pope. No, that's not what I'm saying. But he was saying that Peter was going to become a part and parcel of the very foundation of God's church. In Ephesians 2.20, the word of the Lord says, uh, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles 
and prophets. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You see, God was saying, I'm going to take this pebble and make it into a building block. I'm going to make him part of the very foundation of my kingdom. And he goes on to say, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Hallelujah. In John's description of the New Jerusalem, God's capital city for a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21, 14 declares, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So you see, there was a great blessing promised to the apostles who were the first men on the face of planet earth to receive the revelation from God of who Jesus Christ truly, genuinely, really was. I got news for you. You ever heard somebody talk to you and they got to make a big thing out of nothing? You know, you, they just, just some little old tiny thing and they make a big fuss over it. You know, they'll be telling you, well, I was going to go do this, but then it started raining. And you know, when that rain starts coming out, well, I just thought go blind. I just can't hardly see. And, and then the lights go out, and, and I begin to feel faint, and, and my head starts to swim. And, and, and if I get wet, you know, I, I, I'm like the witch and the Wizard of Oz, and I just kind of shrivel up and die. We have a saying for people like that, and that saying is, people who make mountains out of molehills. You ever heard that saying? Somebody makes a mountain out of a molehill. It means they make something awful big out of something that ain't nothing. Amen. Children, I've got a prophetic word for you tonight. Listen to me. When God said to Peter that day, Cephas, pebble, upon this rock I will build my church. What Jesus was saying is, I'm going to take this molehill and make a mountain out of it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I want you to know that tonight, God is looking at us and he says, you may be nothing but a molehill tonight, but I want to make a mountain out of you. Hallelujah. You may feel like you're nothing more than the pavement that people walk on, but I want to make a building block in the kingdom of God of you tonight. Hallelujah. God wants to make a mountain out of every molehill in this place, and it's done the same way that it was done by Peter. <sighs> by hearing from God. Amen. When you hear from God and you receive the revelation of God, then my friend God will make a mountain out of your molehill. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what people are saying. Jesus said, Peter, what are what, uh, uh, disciples, what do men say? Who do they say that I am? See, it doesn't matter what men say. It doesn't matter what the Watchtower Bible Society says. It doesn't matter what the Roman Catholic Church says. It doesn't matter what the, the Mormons out there in Utah say. He said, what do men say? Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses say this. The Mormons say this. Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is a created being that... God Almighty, Jehovah God, created him for the purpose of atonement. And that he in turn created the world and yada yada. And that's how we kind of bypass all this stuff, that he's the creator. But he's really not the creator. My Bible said, God declared, I am alone and thy redeemer, he said to Israel in the book of Isaiah. And beside me there is no other. There is no redeemer outside of Jehovah God himself. And that was his promise throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. And he declared plainly in Old Testament prophecy that when the Messiah comes, he said, Behold, your God walks in the midst of you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jehovah God didn't have to make somebody to go take his licking for him. He made himself a body. He fashioned a body like that of man. And he enveloped it around his very own spirit. And the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Are there fools out there tell you every kind of crap-ass, jackass doctrine you can imagine? 
And you stand before the Lord, he'll say, who do you say that I am? Don't give me what the watchtower told you, because I don't care. Who do you say that I am? Oh, they said there was no hell. I got news for you. There is. Because that's where you're going. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. He didn't say, I'm going to annihilate you. Now you're disappearing. You're, you're gone from the face of the planet forever. No. He said, I will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And they shall go into darkness, outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Honey, that's an existence. That is a conscious existence. Hell may not be the same thing for everybody that's there. Amen. See, God's not an unjust God. God's not stupid. But I'll tell you, anything outside of the presence of my Jesus throughout eternity would be hell for me. I don't care if I was living in paradise. If Jesus isn't there, it'd be hell for me. Some would be in the plains. Others would be in darkness. Amen. My Bible says the Lord shall record, uh, reward every man how? According to his works. That means that there are degrees of punishment, even as there are degrees of reward. Amen. Not everybody's going to be in the, the same experience in hell. Honey, you know what? You can live in one part of America, have one climate. You can live in another part of America, have a whole different climate. Be like being in two different countries, but you're not. Hell is the same. There will be those there who will experience one thing, and there will be those there who will experience something completely different. You're not going to find the poor, simple-minded fool who fell after some false doctrine and unknowingly was led after the, the, the false doctrine. In order, You're not going to find them burning alongside of Adolf Hitler who murdered millions of God's people. Amen. No, I got news for you. The false prophet and the antichrist and the beast and, you know, and Satan, they're all going to be bound up with chains. And I got news, Hitler and all them are probably going to have front seat tickets. But the Bible said how many will be lost because Satan is the deceiver of the nations. He's deceived nations. If he's deceived nations, what in the world makes you so foolish as to think he can't deceive this movement or that movement or this group or that group. He's got whole nations worshiping idols. Look at India. He's got whole nations worshiping idols. Look at China, the largest country with the greatest population in the world. You think he can deceive all them people, but he can't deceive your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. You better believe he can. And as long as they are sitting back, or as long as you are sitting back, or as long as I am sitting back and waiting for somebody to tell me who God is, you've got a problem on your head. Because God wants to make a mountain out of your mohill, but He can't do that until you open up your ear and you begin to listen to the voice of His Spirit. And like Paul the Apostle, before he was converted, uh, as he was converted, on the road to Damascus, uh, and the light came down from heaven, and the Bible said it fell down on the ground up, and he looked up into the light he knew it was God who was stopping him dead in his tracks but he realized I don't know who God is he thought he knew Curry he was running around murdering Christians because he thought he knew who Jehovah God was Deuteronomy 6 and 4, the highest rule of all Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. When a Jew looks up to heaven and declares, Lord, he is speaking to God. That is who he thinks he's talking to. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer came back, I am Jesus, hallelujah. You know why so many people being led around by the nose, by false doctrine, and false ideas? 
because they want to be. Because this movement or that movement satisfies something within them, satisfies some need or some desire within them. And they never take the time or dare to stand in one place and close their eyes and look up toward heaven and say, Who are you, Lord? Tell me. See, I wrestled with this apostolic message for many years. I was always aware of the debate. Trinity versus the oneness of God and all that. I grew up with a minister, a friend of our family, Brother Tatlock, who was in the Apostolic Jesus Name movement. He dedicated me as a baby, as a matter of fact. And I was always aware of the controversy, always aware of the issue. You know, Grandma Bell, we talk about it. I mean, it was something I, I was always familiar with. But I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and I remember as a 12-year-old boy in the bedroom of, of our house at 378 Burton Road, Deacon Falls, Connecticut. I remember down in that basement bedroom, Mother, one day the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, do you know what you're going to preach? And I said, of course I do, Lord. I've been raised in the assemblies of God. I've been in the church my whole life. I know what I'm going to preach. He said, no, you don't. He told me flat out, no, I didn't know. what I was. I'm like, well, what in the world did God mean by that? And years later, I would wrestle with the doctrines and the issues, oneness of God versus the Trinity and who Jesus really is, and I wrestled with it, and I searched the scriptures, and I, 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 oh, I could always find the arguments that the Trinity uses to be persuasive, and I could always, you know, blah, 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 this and that. Well, honey, all of a sudden, one day, God spoke to me, Dallas and I moved to Athens, and God said, I want you in the United Pentecostal Church. That's an apostolic church. And I said, Lord, you want me to go to an apostolic? He said, yes. I always wrestled with the issue of the doctrines, you know. I said, okay. I went and I told the pastor, I'm Trinitarian, always be Trinitarian, blah, 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 blah. Then baptized in Jesus' name because I do believe that is the biblical form and method of baptism. I said, but aside from that, that's as far as I'll go, yada, yada, yada. I was in his church and he'd get up and preach and the anointed man be on that man, Brother Davis, you know. He was a good preacher. And he'd sit there, and every time I'd kind of laugh or try to, try to debate with him a little bit, he'd kind of laugh at me. He, he, didn't even, he wouldn't even debate. He'd just kind of giggle, and he'd say, he'd say, you'll come. You'll come around. You'll understand it. That's all he'd say. Wouldn't talk to me. I couldn't get him to talk to me about the issues. Because what man thinks about who Jesus is is not important. And Brother Davis knew that even though he knew the truth, it, that his opinion still wasn't important. That I still needed to get the revelation. And finally one day, Mother, I went home to that little house I showed you all there. The little white house, you know. Walked in that house. I sat down at my table. I said, now, Lord, I'll tell you what. I said, I can't take this anymore. I said, I want to know who you are. You get serious with God, I'm going to tell you a secret. God will get serious with you. Draw nigh unto God. What? He'll draw nigh unto you. You want to start getting your mind set on Jesus? Jesus will get his mind set on you. And I'm telling you, I said, Lord, I want to know the truth. And I sat down and opened my Bible. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my entire life, I read the Bible like it was a brand new book. No doctrine that had ever been preached to me as a kid was in the back of my mind. No dogma, nothing. I just read it for what it said. And all I saw throughout the Old Testament was the prophecy that Messiah would be God himself, the Redeemer, rising up in the land of Israel to redeem both his people and those outside of his fold uh, for a posterity throughout all eternity. And I said, my God. Then I read the New Testament and I saw time and time again that this Jesus was called the Son of God, which means he was God in human form. I sent an invitation out this week to a rabbi to come visit our church. 
Because I want folks to understand who the Jews believe Jesus said he was. See, some of you folks have been in churches and in organizations. They're so busy telling you who Jesus really is. But it's so funny that not a one of them would dare tell you who the Jews said Jesus actually said he was. Because I've spoken to at least four or five dozen Jews over the last 20 years, and every single one I've asked the theological question, just answer me this, who did Jesus claim to be? Their answer is, without fail, God. They don't say the Son of God, they say God. And when I say, don't you mean the Son of God? And they say, no, for a man to declare himself the Son of God simply means he is God in a human form. You see, they understand it. Now, if you're going to read a Bible, friends, that was written by Jews, who understood it that way, and who in most instances were writing to Jews, who understood it that way, and you're going to read it, and you're going to understand it in some other way, then, honey, somebody's missing the boat somewhere. If you're going to read a book that's written to Jews by Jews and they have a clear understanding that a certain term means a certain thing, that means if you're going to read that book, you better come into their understanding. That's why Paul had to do so much explanation to the Gentile people. Because they didn't have that same understanding the Jewish people did. And he had to help them understand what was going on. And why Jesus didn't say plainly and clearly, I'm going away, but I'm going to come back to you. Well, bless God, when the Lord ascends, you get a bunch of ding lings running around. He's coming back to establish his kingdom. Glory to God. Any day now, let's rise up and let's fight Rome. And let's, let's uh, you know, the Lord's coming back. Well, in the middle of the battle, here will come King Jesus to rescue us. That's what they would have done. Bunch of dope heads. And Jesus knew that. So you know what he did? He said, now the comforter, he said, whom the Father will send in my name. He said, see, it's expedient that I go away. He said, but the comforter, whom the Father shall send in my name, in my name, what's he mean in my name? If I go somewhere in somebody's name, I'm representing them. Am I not? Okay. The word in the Greek for comforter is paraclete, which means literally a mirror image. The Holy Ghost is nothing more than Jesus Christ himself, but in a different manifestation than physical. It is Jesus in an invisible manifestation. It's not another person of the Trinity. It's not another person of anything. No, it's Jesus himself. That's why Paul said, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But Paul also said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So honey, it can't be that the Holy Ghost is one spirit and the spirit of Christ is another spirit. Amen. Amen. And who then is the father of baby Jesus? Because according to the scriptures, God the Father is his father, but God the Father can't possibly be his father because after all, the Holy Ghost is the one that overshadowed Mary and she conceived of the Holy Ghost. So therefore, if they're separate persons, then the true father of the baby Jesus is the Holy Ghost. You see see how foolish it is? If they're separate persons, then all of a sudden you've got a problem on your hands. But when you understand, Jesus says to his disciples, talking about the Holy Ghost, he said, He has been with you, but he shall be in you. You see, he had to talk, you might say, in code. Because he knew he couldn't tell these knuckleheads straight out what was going on, because they're not going to understand it. They're not going to get it. A lot of what he said, he said 
knowing that hindsight is 2020. Once it happens, they're going to get it. They're going to understand it. But in the meantime, they're going to be a little in the dark so that they don't go out and act stupid. But we've got religious movements today that are running around trying to redefine the scriptures and they can say something they don't say because the Lord had to speak this way because they don't understand why he had to speak this way and because they're not reading what was written with the same understanding that those who wrote it had. Amen. Make sense? Amen. God wants to make mountains out of mohills today. God is... Let me go here. God is today in the business of making mountains out of mohills, giants out of midgets, and stones out of pebbles, building materials out of pavement. The, the question that the Lord asks today is, who do men say that I am? And while the religious and zealous men of the Lord's day had struggled with the issue of his identity as his power was undeniable, surely the Lord had declared himself to be the Son of God or a God-man as it were. But what was the consensus of those who were trying to figure this man Jesus out with their own scriptural interpretations and their own grasps or understandings of messianic prophecy? and in their own ideas of what God was or should be doing. For a lot of movements, a lot of these religious movements, they define Jesus based on their idea of what God should be doing. See, there's a certain religious movement out there that believes that God should just come and take over the world and reestablish his kingdom and make everything right and, and all the, the wicked should be abolished and then all the righteous should live on a peaceful, wonderful earth. And that's the way they see it ought to happen. So they tell God how it ought to happen. That's the way we see it, God. Well, you see, that's why they crucified Jesus because he didn't do it the way that, that they thought he was going to do it. He was the promised Messiah. He was the Christ. But he wasn't doing it the way we thought it was going to be done. And there's a lot of people today that have miswritten, misinterpreted the scriptures in order to make it say something it doesn't say because they want it to say what they want it to say. And that's scary. Because, honey, God can't make a mountain out of a molehill if the molehill hadn't got its ears open and listening for the revelation of God. God wants to reveal His truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, when we know who Jesus is, that's not the end all and be all. That's the beginning of all truth. That's the beginning of our journey. God is seeking a people tonight who, like the apostles of old, are able to look beyond the religious reasonings of men and hear His voice. In John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45, the word of the Lord declares, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. And they shall all be taught of God. Organization tells you you need us to know God. There are lying sack of demons from hell from away. The biggest liar in the world was a gentleman named Russell years ago over in England who started a movement that ultimately became what is known today as Jehovah's Witnesses. That man wrote his interpretation of Scripture and then said that if you read the Bible for ten years, you'll know less of God than if you read my writings for one year. No, that was his declaration. His writings were more important than the Scriptures. Jesus said, search the Scriptures. Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. I got news for you children. The Old and the New Testament both testify of King Jesus. The Jehovah you read about in the Old Testament became the Jehovah salvation of the New Testament. That's what the name Jesus means. Jehovah is salvation. 
That's what it came for. That's what Jehovah revealed himself to humanity for, was to become our salvation. That's why he used the name Jesus. That's why the angel said, thou shalt call his name Jesus. That's why the angel said his name should be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. There are not two gods in heaven today. There were never two gods in heaven. There never will be two gods in heaven. There's not but one. Who does the Old Testament scriptures testify of, represent, and describe? They testify of and describe Jehovah God. Many would agree, yes, they describe Jehovah God. But my friend, Jesus said they testify of me. For when Jesus spoke the word, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me in John 5, 39. I got news for you. The only thing that existed in that day that any Jew would call scriptures was what we would call the Old Testament. So he was saying, go back in the book and read it again and you'll see me everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> John 14, 8 and 10. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. John 14, 6 and 7, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why is that? Because if you don't understand that Jesus is the Father, my friend, you're never going to find the Father. If you try to find Jehovah God and don't look to Jesus to see Him, then you're going the wrong way because that's not the way to get to Jehovah. The only way to see Jehovah is to see Jesus. No man hath seen God at any time, but He which came down and revealed Himself to man. He's revealed Him to us. That's what Paul said. He, Jesus, has revealed the Father to us. He's revealed Jehovah God to us. What a wonderful gift that God would come down and, and, and I mean, just take the hand of humanity and shake it and say, I want to know you. Amen. My Lord, have mercy. John 16, verses... I told you there's a lot here, but I'm going to try and finish it quickly. John uh, 16, 12 through 16 says, I have yet many things to say unto you. This is Jesus speaking. He said, but ye cannot bear them now. You see, remember when I was telling you earlier about the climate and the, the environment and the Lord knew they couldn't understand half of what he said. He goes on to say, how be it when he, the, the spirit of truth is come. Now, who is truth? Jesus is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the spirit of truth is none other than himself. He says, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine. In other words, I am the source from which this manifestation is protruding, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. God has declared... My glory will I share with no other. Yet the Bible says that Jesus Christ shall descend from heaven in the last day in the glory of the Father. God said, I won't share my glory with any other. He don't have to because he's one and the same. It's the same person. The different manifestation of the same person. A human being is body, soul, and spirit. That's not three people. It's three aspects of one human being. God is body, soul, and spirit. Jesus Christ the man was the body. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. They're all three aspects of our one God. Easy. It's not a hard thing. 
The only human being that ever had the soul of God within his breast was the man, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Romans 8 and 14 declares, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see, not, not for as many as are led by this organization, not so many as are led by...